This is one of the books, one of the earlier books I had from Thomas Feuerstein. It's called Round Up Ready. It's from 2002. And it's uh, from a time when Thomas was still working mainly with classical electronic processual media, like a real media artist. And uh, it was a book that is uh, combining capitalism with Darwinism. And it's a very early work, but the color green comes back and back and back and back in Thomas' work. And it was a bit intriguing, although it's not that obvious. But if you flick through many of his art books and catalogs, I brought some here for consultation just after the keynote. Psychoprosa, or The Outcast of the Universe. Or yeah, also this very thick book called Trickster, which also have this molecule painted as circles onto the very cover page. And these circles you will find them back this evening actually in the gallery. And I don't want to tell you all the story, but you tr if you try to read them, you maybe come across a kind of very philosophical text, but it will take you a lot of, lot of energy and a lot of glucose to actually decipher that. And this is what the exhibition is about this evening. So we have one artwork that is really green and the other which is really red. The one refers really to the plant world and the other refers really to the animal world, so to say. So the title of the exhibition is Stoffskifter. Stoffskifter in Danish uh, means like in German, uh, Stoffwechsel. But it's a kind of exhibition of metabolic machines and metabolic machines because they are like a little bit like pataphysical um, Junggesellen machine, they are a little bit of uh, machines that carry out operations that are both symbolic, poetic, but at the same time are also physically, biologically operating. So there's a shift in art, and this is, I think, the topic of the keynote about the green unicorns, that there is to be a shift in art of a kind of material consciousness that entering the scene, and when many people talk about so-called bio-art, they just sit it in a kind of very, very awkward um, uh, range of, uh, of, of uh, exotism. And there is an interesting other take of it to it than when you can think of the presence-based and not representation-based character of these artworks, but also that we have a shift from metaphor to metabolism. And between that also in a biosemiotic sense, uh, life makes sense, and that in this sense of making sense, you have also uh, non-conscious cognition and you have operation processes that are symbolic, iconic, or other kind of symbolic forms that also are present in the biological work. So Thomas Feuerstein's work picks this all up and uh, just a short presentation that you, of course, can read as well in the catalog, so I'll make this very short. Thomas is a Vienna-based artist and writer whose works oscillate between the field of fine arts and media arts. And uh, he has also obtained his doctoral degree in 1995. He's, in fact, a philosopher. He's always hiding this a little bit away. <laughs> and after some research commissions in the early age of media art in Austria by the Austrian Ministry of Science on Art and Electronic Space and Art and Architecture in the early 90s, he became also a regular lecturer and visiting professor at numerous universities and art academies um, uh, worldwide. And as an art artist, uh, he is bridging actually the interface of applied and theoretical science, and his projects always combine complex bodies of knowledge from philosophy, art history, literature, um, but also epistemology, the biotechnological science, and really mixes them up in a kind of very complex entanglement. So at the core of his practice is an artistic method he calls conceptual narration, and please welcome Thomas now to this keynote what, to learn about what is conceptual narration. Yes, thank you, Jens Hauser, for the introduction and for the warm welcome. Uh, today I want to talk about green unicorns. So, uh, exactly 200 years ago, it was in 1818, uh, the French chemist Pierre-Joseph Pelletier wrote, the green matter of all plants, we propose to give the name of chlorophyll. At least since then, we not only associate... Oh, sorry. It works? At least since then, we not only associate green with plants, but with chlorophyll. 
Chlorophyll becomes the archetypical green. The greenest plant cell with the highest concentration of chlorophyll is the microalgae chlorella. And chlorella means literally small green. Chlorella is more than two billion years old, so it's maybe the oldest exist, still existing plant cell on the world. Uh, it's a common model organism in Potany, and in 1961, Melvin Colvin received the Nobel Prize for his research with chlorella on photosynthesis. For me, chlorella is more than just an alga. It is a narrative not for my art, where green as a pigment and material, the history of science, nature, and culture intersect. I have cultivated chlorella for different projects. The process is very simple. To optimize photosynthesis, algae are pumped through hoses or tubes to expose the cells to light in order to increase the cell growth. The hoses and tubes function much like the leaves of a tree. More leaves or more tubes provide more surface for light absorption. In addition, the hoses act as lines and strokes in exhibitions. They become green drawings in space. But green is more than a color for me. Green is a narrative knot in which various narrative threads converge. In the sense of the American anthropologist Clifford Gertz, green is, can be understood as a sick description of culture. Green stands in for autotrophy, photosynthesis, and metabolism in nature, but green also is a comprehensive metaphor in our culture. It is a narrative entanglement of contradictory meanings and theories, hopes and fears. To simplify, there are two types of green, the entropic and the necentropic green. The necentropic green symbolizes life itself, because the entire metabolism in our body and beyond in our culture would be unsinkable without green. Without green, no grain, no corpse, no energy for our bodies, no resources for our economy. But green also stands for entropy and alienation. The green hell of nature is a threat to civilization. The entropic green destroys culture. It overgrows houses, roots blast roads, forests swallow settlements and so on. Green hell destabilizes culture, sweetens health, materials, and technology. Green hell represents the pre-modern, the savage, and uncivilized. The green hell is full of uncertainty, full of uncanny, risky, and unpleasant surprises, anarchy, lawlessness, unknown diseases, murderous creatures. Green is illegal, subversive, undermining order and progress. In one word, Green is criminal, and green kills, because it is an entropy accelerator. The negatropic green creates a subconscious fear of green alienation. Also chlorophyll and hemoglobin are only very minimal different. In molecular terms, the difference is just one atom. Magnesium instead of iron. They represent two completely different worlds, the green and the red world. Green is not only the complementary color of red, it is also both metabolically and symbolically the other alien and unhuman life. Green stands for the uncanny, marks the dark side of human existence, is formless like green slime, or comes from other words like green aliens. Like in movies such as the invasion of the body snatchers, or Day of the Drivets, where green destabilizes society and culture. Green stands for the rebellion of nature towards human culture, enlightenment, rationality, and control. The rescue of culture requires green fictions and green order. The chaos of the green hell is opposed to the green paradise. The green paradise represents a cosmos in itself, a cosmetically purified order, the clean green. In art history, the orderly and clean green is symbolized in the form of a Hortus Conclusus, the Garden of Mary, 
in which the green is domesticated for the benefit of man. The Hortus Conclusus shows an anthropocentric green that includes the savage, the unknown, and the life threatening organisms. Like the Maxwell demon, there's a door guard who only admits the negentropic green and excludes the entropic. The green paradise is an exclusive garden. It's a hortus exclusus. In the spirit of the garden of Mary, a virgin pure green is spread like in a medieval petri dish. In medieval representations of the hortus conclusus, we often find a unicorn. The noblest of all mythical animals was considered a symbol of the pure and the good. This means a better, a refined nature. Fables and fictions create myths, and these in turn create obsessions that lead to technical facts, artifacts, and biofacts. In the early 20th century, the American biologist William Franklin Dove took the horn buds from a newborn bull calf and transplanted them onto the center of the skull. It developed a single straight horn. So domestication, selective breeding, biotechnology, and genetics are aimed to the creation of unicorns. Agricultural land is the hottest conclusions of today. It includes all types of life except the pure, improved, and optimized ones. This means that fields, glass houses, and plantations are inhabited by unicorns or hybrid plants only, and that only specially bred animals graze on the fields. Green unicorns are no longer rare and precious rarities like their mythical predecessor, but they dominate the biomass and dramatically reduce biodiversity. Today, unicorns are growing inflationary in the form of monocultures. Unicorn gets literally the meaning of one corn, one sort of wheat, one sort of soy or rice, and becomes the symbol of the capitalist green. Unicorns are green machines. They produce starch or transform starch into meat. The largest horti conclusi, like the Anna Greek station in Australia, are of a size that corresponds to half of the size of Denmark. The Hortus Conclusus no longer needs sick wars. It uses synthoids, like here the Mar del Plastico in Andalusia, and creates its own climate. It uses chemical wars, such as pesticides, or move the wall right inside the genome. Nothing else is suggested by the brand name Roundup. Green unicorns are part of our fictions, fears, hopes, obsessions, and social behavior. In this sense, the useless, economically unproductive green does not just have to be the green hell. It can also be the symbol of prosperity and power. Green lawns became popular with the aristocracy in Northern Europe from the Middle Ages on. They were an element of wealthy estates and manor houses. Since the 17th century on, the English lawn was a symbol of status of the aristocracy and gentry. It showed that the owner could afford to keep land that was not being used for building or for food production. The bigger and neater the lawn, the more powerful the landlord. With Louis XIV and Versailles, Tapis Verde, the green carpet, became an integral part of political and social representation. To this day, the green lawn serves the representation of power. Even in desert areas, more and more lawns are being built, such as the 100,000 square meters large field in front of the newly built Museum of Islamic Art in Qatar. The green lawn outside and the green table inside demonstrate the power of representation. This reveals green politics and arrogates the sovereignty over nature and land. The success of the green lawn as an anthropogenic vegetation cover was enthusiastically adopted by the aspiring bourgeoisie in the 19th century and continues till today. Especially since the 1950s, the green of the lawn in front of the house tells of the supposed economic and moral condition of the residents. 
Green lawn means good people, brown or unknown lawn means bad people. The lawn is a symbol of an anthropocentric understanding of nature of a civilized damp green. The lawn is a green unicorn, a single variety monoculture that is subjected to industry standards. The hardest conclusions from the Garden of Mary to Sports Stadium that is of a cultural, historically grown, anthropocentric understanding of nature as a misunderstanding. <coughs> for this reason, the small green chlorella presents a narrative not for me where different stories about green become entangled. In my artistic method, I call it conceptual narration. Chlorella is not only a model organism in botany, but also in art. For example, I use the algae as a big man for monochrome paintings and bring the green lawn into the house. The green algae grow in flask and tubes. I call the sculptures and installations manna machines. And at the end of an exhibition, the biomass of the algae is filtered, dried, and processed into pigment. Fused in oil or resin, the algae pigment becomes the material for a series of paintings titled Harvest, because the artist, like a farmer, brings in the harvest. The harvest of algae determines the size or the number of paintings. Usually one large or three small paintings can be produced each year. I can also transform the green pigment into gray or into black. I produce pot ash, which is linked to the context of soap and gunpowder production with algae in history. Or I simply transform the green into black carbon, by heating the algae. For me, monochrome paintings are lawns. The history of abstract and monochrome paintings shows that well. The word lawn is also related to thin linen or cotton clothes. And in this sense, a canvas and a painting both are lawns, in the sense of a tapis verd. Art, materials, pigments, create the nucleus of my conceptual generation with chlorella. It is the initial point to intertwine art with threads of technology, politics, cultural history, and possible futures. The small green of chlorella works as a narrative note that brings together all the big issues and questions for our time, food, climate, and resources. With regards to the context of painting and pigment, the algae address symbolic and iconic meanings. But I also use chlorella as nutrition to trigger further processes. I filter out the algae in order to feed Drosophila flies, another common uh, model organism in natural sciences. I first composed drawings with a transparent sugar solution, also produced by the algae, to attract the flies. The insects then absorb the sugar solution, stay stuck, and turn themselves into forming different portraits. Here you can see Adam Smith and the effect of the invisible hand as formed by flies. Or here you can see Thomas Hobbes Leviathan. So chlorella, the small green, is the solution for all big problems. It's supposed to solve uh, climate problems, hunger problems, uh, and carbon dioxide uptakes. It can clean our environment and wastewater, for example, here in Bangalore, India. It can provide food, like here in Africa, and while producing food, chlorella can clean our atmosphere and be used for carbon sequestration, like here in Klötze, Germany, where the emissions of a thermal power plant are purified. Furthermore, chlorella is associated with utopian ideas and science fiction. Following global fears of an uncontrollable human population boom during the early 1950s, Chlorella was seen as a new and promising primary food source and as a possible solution to the world hunger crisis. Many institutions, especially in the United States, began to research algae, including the Rockefeller Foundation, the Atomic Energy Commission, or Stanford University. For the people on Earth, the cultivation costs were at this time too high. But for astronauts, the idea is still alive. Self-sustaining systems and isolated artificial biospheres 
became the new Hortus Conclusus during the Cold War. In Siberia, the Soviets built Bio-3, the biological closed life support system. The aim was to create a micro-Earth which one day could be transported to the Moon or to Mars. In that Hortus Conclusus, gas, water and food systems were completely enclosed. Chlorella algae were used to recycle air pressed out by humans, absorbing carbon dioxide and replenishing it with oxygen through photosynthesis. This year, the Institute of Space Systems at the University of Stuttgart will test two photobioreactor chambers for the cultivation of chlorella in the International Space Station. So in future, chlorella will not only regenerate the breasts, but also cover up to 30% of the astronauts' daily nutritional needs. Chlorella is the new manner for the exodus from planet Earth. And for me, chlorella is somehow a strange projection screen for ideologies and utopias. Another strong threat is green energy. Coal, gas, and crude oil are usually the old rotten green. But black can also be the new green. Brown coal is formed in nature within 50,000 to 50 million years, but with hydrothermal carbonization within a few hours. The hydrothermal carbonization, which transforms organic materials into coal, was in investigated by Friedrich Berlius in 1913. Last year, the first scale hydrothermal carbonization plant in of Germany, was put into service. My hydrothermal carbonization sculpture here looks quite different and is quite smaller. But inside the black sphere is a high pressure reactor that converts chlorella algae into carbon. A high pressure reactor is a very strong encapsulated Hortus conclusus with a pressure close to 200 bars and a water temperature over 300 degrees. The sculpture produces Kohle für die Kunst, coal for art, and abrasts the carbon powder into jars for drawings. So the material, coal or carbon, deriving from algae, is here both significant and signifier. This charcoal drawing, Bolo for the Boer, refers to the miners who went on strike in the 1980s under the Thatcher government. The British coal strike has become a symbol of political change, Thatcherism and neoliberalism. And here you can see an ironical overlay of Karl Marx and Margaret Thatcher. The aspect to use matter and materials as significant and signifier is important for my art. A simple example. René Magritte's famous painting carries the inscription, this is not the pipe. For my drawing, I used a real pipe. I set it on fire, and with the ash I did the drawing with the inscription, this was a pipe. For me, the two drawings refer to two different paradigms, the linguistic turn and the material turn. In fine arts, we usually have three basic narrative levels. First, the visual or iconic level. This includes paintings, drawings, sculptures, other art objects. Second, the linguistic level. This includes concepts of artists, language as material for artworks, various theories, art philosophy, art talks. And third, we have the level of matter, molecules and metabolism. All art forms are based on matter and matter materials, but especially fine art. In European art history, matter always was a deficit and fault. In the Middle Ages, the fine arts belonged to the artist mechanica and not to the artist liberales. A material art, such as music or literature, had priority because it was bodiless and discarnate. It was not touched by dirty matter and flesh. But, the form, but from the moment on that we talk about the molecular age, this former deficit becomes a specific quality. Contemporary art can imply matter, material, and materiality in a conceptual and in a real way. 
And that is one point why fine art is so interesting to me in the context of present reality. This charcoal painting or drawing shows a typewriter, but instead of letters on the keys, you will find the elements of a periodic table. A typewriter like this is an old-fashioned device, but it leads to future ways of writing. In the age of digital and genetic writing, we have CNC machines, 3D printers, and CRISPR. We begin to write new text forms. Instead of letters and words, we use atoms and molecules. The German poets Christoph Wieland and Johann Wolfgang Goethe invented the term Weltliteratur in the 18th century. Today, word literature takes on a new meaning. Literature not only describes the world any longer, it produces the objects of the world. A transmutation, or better, a transubstantiation that goes one step further takes place in the project Psychoprosa. It starts again with chlorella algae and the fungus Psilocybe cubensis. And the process culminates in two sculptures. Ironically, I call them the smallest and the largest sculpture of the world. When algae and fungi start a symbiosis, we usually call it lichen. But in my project, I'm interested in the chemical substances in topamine, which is produced from the tyrosine of the algae, and psilocybin, which is extracted from the mushrooms. On the left side, we can see Mrs. D, D stands for topamine, and on the right side, we can see Mr. B, B stands for psilocybin. They stand on refrigerators that offer pedestals, such as in galleries or museums. But the fridges also prepare the cooling water for the chemical processes. Both cultures are a little bit like mom and dad. For me, the objects are not just laboratory equipment. They are glass sculptures, which act like performers. They are more subjects than objects, because they process, produce, transform, communicate, and translate. The British philosopher John Austin asked how to do things with words. I ask how to tell a story with matter and metabolism and molecules. The synthesis of the new molecule is like a marriage or the birth of a baby. On the left hand, you can see baby Psi, the structure model of the new molecule. And here we can see the reaction path, the love affair or childbearing described by the chemist. As a sculptor, I have been obsessed by the idea of creating a new molecule for many years. A molecule is an object in space, but it is invisible. Ironically, therefore, I call it the smallest sculpture in the world. But you can crystallize it, or you can swallow it and move the sculpture from the exhibition space into your own body, blood, and brain. Then the molecular sculpture acts like a psychotropic drug. It transforms the perception and makes hard objects soft and liquid. The atmosphere starts to press and to billow. So it's not just a synthetic molecule for me, it's a sculpture related to art, perception, and aesthetics. The psychotropic effects of the small sculpture are strong and not appropriate for visitors. But there is no need. On the macro level, the byproducts of the molecular synthesis create similar effects. It's like cooking coffee. You cannot see the caffeine, but the coffee ground remains and you usually waste it. But the waste is interesting for me. It contains, among other slimy things, cellulose and glycoproteins. If you prepare the slimy remains chemically, mix them with water and cool them down, you get a huge amount of high viscous substance. So the smallest sculpture turns into the largest sculpture. Slime is a disgusting material, and there's no form, no order. It stands for entropy and decay, and it is a symbol of the uncanny. In our culture, we are afraid of any kind of entropy, and we try to keep ourselves dry. We try not to sweat or to cry. We keep our lives and our civilization dry. That's why we have a dry places like archives, libraries, and museums. But we are born in slime, and we end up in the grave as slime. In between, we try to stay dry. 
Maybe it is uh, the shortest culture theory. Slime is the opposite of the unicorn in the Hortus conclusus. It crosses all boundaries, all walls. Similar to biofilms and microbiomes, it connects all entities, all surfaces and spaces. According to Lovecraft and his slime Cthulhu monster, things and beings seem creepy to us if they don't have a solid structure. So sh shapeshifters come from hell and bring chaos and disorder. The American conceptual artist Robert Morris coined the term antiform, which defines slime perfectly. Antiform helps to think form in a new context of materials and aesthetics. If Morris suggests antiform to rethink form, we maybe also need anti-green to consider green. For example, how would plants look like if they could absorb not only the red and blue spectrum of light for photosynthesis? Imagine a plant which is able to consume all frequencies, including radio frequencies, so we might get a smartphone plant and it would probably have black leaves maybe. My works have references to pathophysical art, but I use science and technology, machines and laboratory apparatus, not only in a metaphorical or allegorical way, like Cherie, Roussel or Duchamp. That's why I prefer the term poetic more than aesthetic. I use poetic in the very Greek meaning of poesis, in the sense of making and producing. The objects are performing, self-acting subjects, and they talk with processes, living organisms, matter, and molecules. Metaphors and allegories are the traditional language of art, but metabolism is the crucial point of contemporary art today. Metabolism enables art to enter reality, to link artworks with processes in nature and society and our daily life. An artwork is a clash of the symbolic realm and the realm of the real. Only the transformation and translations between those spheres bring an artwork into the world. In this sense, my art is a metabolism as a new realism. According to Harald Seemann's legendary exhibition When Attitudes Become Form, my favorite suggestion for an update for his formula would be When Metabolism Becomes Form. In Catholic consecration, we have a very magic kind of metabolism called transubstantiation. It means the transmutation of bread into flesh and of wine into blood. In the Middle Ages, it was also called mutatio materialis. In nature, this is the main principle of metabolism and life, and today it's the focus of biotechnology. The most powerful transubstantiation machines in nature are plants and photosynthesis. Water, carbon dioxide and oxygen transmute to glucose and to cellulose. If you break down grain to one molecule, it is glucose. Metabolism from microbes to our human body and brain depend on glucose, but also our economy and social life. Without glucose, we would have no cellulose, no wood, no paper, no books, no clothes, nothing to eat, and so on. Glucose is a symbol for life and metabolism, but is more than an icon or a sign. Significant and signifier are entangled in one molecule. That's why it's not just a symbol for life. It belongs to a different category. I call it metabol instead of symbol, because it crosses the border to the real. Art is not any longer only a semiotic system, it becomes a metabolic system. This is the crucial point which makes fine art contemporary and specific. You can use a metabol only in fine arts. Literature, theater, film are really great media, but they can only work with symbols and not with metabols. They can represent or speak about reality, but they cannot use real objects and processes by themselves. This elucidates the turn from metaphors to metaphors. The American art historian William John Mitchell mentioned that pio art should be understood as really nothing else than something having the ability to provocate critical debate about biotechnology. 
He pretends that Pio artworks just inspire to produce comments. I think this is an important point, but it fails completely. The relevance of bio art for art in general is much broader. Biology and science-based art produces more than just commentaries. I say form follows metabolism, and metabolic art produces new poetics, aesthetics, and asks the question of form in a completely different new way. Green as a metabol is not just a color. It involves all metabolic processes, and embodies universal topics ranging from thermodynamics to global economics to the processes in our brain. Anti-green, in the sense of Morris anti-form, opens up the diversity of green and extends it into metabolic connections. Green, in this sense, also means black, like carbon, or red, like flesh and blood. My project, Pancreas then, is realized as a kind of transubstantiation from glucose to human flesh. It proliferates a conceptual narration as a biochemical metabolism. The title pancreas refers to our organ pancreas, which is responsible for the blood sugar level. But literally, pan means all, and creas means flesh. So the English title results as all flesh. Etymologically, creas and creativity have nothing in common. But according to Pancreas, creativity means to do something with flesh, to bring an idea into flesh, to incarnate an idea. In times of biotechnology, incarnation is not a metaphor any longer, it's a real practice. The metabolism of the sculpture proceeds in three steps. First, books or papers are soaked in water and shredded to pulp. This happens in the machine on the right hand. After that, second, the pulp is pressed into an artificial intestine, a biofermenter, in which bacteria break down the cellulose into glucose. This is possible since cellulose, the main component of paper, is the polymer of glucose. And in the third step, after filtering and purifying the glucose, is fed to the cells growing inside the glass tank. What we see is not the brain in the what. A brain is an organ, but a glass brain with, with human brain cells. The feeding of the brain cells follows a strict diet. The brain food exclusively consists of Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. The sugar, or glucose, extracted from Hegel's books is further fermented and distilled into alcohol. While well, in the processual sculpture, pancreas, the sugar feeds the cells, the work entitled sarcophagus, produces the alcohol which preserves the cell once the process of growth is completed. So life and death, growing and preserving, are two sides of the same coin. A brain in a wad brings the idea of the hortus conclusus to the point, and at the same time, it is a unicorn itself. Unicorns have always been imaginations and fantasies hallucinated by our brain, but now the brain itself becomes a unicorn. We construct digital and biological unicorns, leaving as software in computers or wetware in bioreactors. Laboratories, petri dishes, bioreactors are the new hearty conclusive, where the new unicorns are cultivated. When I work with living organisms, I prefer model organisms used in daily laboratory work, or I use my own cells taken from my body. This triggers reflections on identity, but also on a new culture of what is considered a body, and selfishness. So many things can be cultivated and produced by our own body cells and tissues, from the leather of our shoes to the burger we eat. Sustainability becomes a new, maybe perverted connotation. And Narcissen, which for instance Marshall McLuhan mentioned as a feedback state of media consumption, turns in the wake of tissue engineering into cannibalism. We are not only looking at ourselves, we start to eat and to consume ourselves. Here starts a type of poesis which I call the poetry of cannibalism. 
I would like to show you two short examples related to the Hortus Conclusus as a petri dish. For Oncoshirt in the 1990s, my own epidermal cells were cultivated to form artificial skin. I wanted to use the skin layers for materials used by artists in the studio, so for example, sketchbooks or canvases. Additionally, I wanted to use the artificial skin as a second skin for clothes, but this left sketch of a so-called Oncoshirt hasn't been realized yet because it was too expensive at that time. Another project for this uh, engineers at the Medical University in Innsbruck worked some years ago on a, developing a modified CD player for counting cells automatically in petri dishes. They took some cartilage cells, so ear cells, from my ear to grow them on a blank CD. Supported by special software, the data was transformed into audio signals. So what you hear is the artist's ear, and it was an ironical homage to Van Gogh. The sci-fi movie, Soil and Green, there's a story from green to red, from algae to human flesh. So sustainability ends in autophagy and cannibalism. Another story about green is told by French socialist Gabriel Dart in his novel Underground Man. The plot is post-apocalyptic story of an earth destroyed by a new ice age. There is no green left. The people live in caves and eat frozen animals they find in the ice. But I ask how long could we survive under the condition of no green? I show you an example, a simple example, of what I call new bat economy, where dogs eat cats and cats eat dogs. We get a thermodynamic economy that leads very quickly to an anthropic finality. Here we can see two charts. The left one shows the survival time for all dogs and cats in Germany, and the right one in the United States. The survival time without hunger lasts only between 9 and 12 days. If you did the calculation for humans, it would be similar. Systems without autotrophic organisms, without green, cannot survive for a very long time. On the surface of the Earth, the economy of life is based on light. It is called photoautotrophy, which means feeding on light. Photoautotrophy is a technology supported by the sun and by light. It comes from heaven. But there is another kind of autotrophy in the dark underworld called chemolithoautotrophy. Chemolithoautotrophy is the ungreen green. It's not the green of heaven and paradise, it's the anti-green of darkness and hell. The earliest life forms were archaea and bacteria, especially so-called chemolithoautotrophic organisms. Litho means stone and autotroph means self-feeding. They feed on inorganic materials from stones and minerals. In this bioreactor here, chemolithoautotrophic bacteria, this species called Acidizio bacillus ferrooxidans, uh, grow. They feed on pirate stone, and as the name suggests, uh, they produce sulfuric acid. So the metabolism of bacteria makes the water more and more acidic. And the water is pumped through these hoses to a marble stone. The sulfuric acid reacts with the limestone and transforms the calcium carbonate into gypsum. The pH value of the process water gets neutralized and flows back to the reactor vessel. This is important for the uh, continuing growth of bacteria. The stone and the sculpture are slowly decomposed. In traditional sculpting, gypsum usually stands at the beginning of a sculpture to make a model. Here, gypsum marks the end point of the sculpture. Similar to nature, where cave systems were washed out by acidic water, the bacteria and process water become tools, just like a chisel, to give the sculpture a new form. For example, the largest gypsum crystals were found in the Nica cave in Mexico, up to 14 meters long and weighing 15 tons. Last year, numerous unknown species of chemolithoautotrophic bacteria were found in these crystals, and in part, 
they could be revived in the laboratory after 50,000 years of encapsulation. Here we can see the work of wheat machine. The gypsum derived from the sculpture is sedimented and the human marble figure is transformed into an alien form, a renamed scent of an octopus. In the background, you can see some drawings made with chalk crayons. I produced the crayons by myself out of the gypsum of the sculpture. Chalk crayons are common in artist studios. They are made of gypsum and pigments. And here the brown pigment is rusty iron and derives from the pyrite and the metabolism of bacteria. The drawings accompany a fictional story and an audio play that I wrote for the project, something in between science fiction and horror. In addition to the transformation of the sculpture into gypsum, we have a second transubstantiation. The marble sculpture is a replica of Prometheus bound by the French sculptor Nicolas Sebastian Adam from the 18th century. I have chosen the ancient Greek Prometheus team for more than one reason. Prometheus is the first sculptor <clears throat> and creator of human beings. He brings fire, science, and technology. For stealing the fire, he was punished by Zeus and done to the Caucasus. Every day, Zeus sends an eagle named Aiton to feed on the liver of Prometheus. Prometheus is a very common and anthropogenic myth which extrapolates human future. I'm especially interested in the liver. Liver and life were synonymous for the ancient Greeks. They used the liver as a prophetic media to forecast the future. For Prometheus delivered, I used liver cells for a kind of hepatoscopy in the age of biotechnology. The liver is not eaten by a bird in my project. It's the opposite. I feed human liver cells with nutrition supplied by the chemolithoautotrophic bacteria. So we get the transubstantiation of stone into organic flesh. After an enzymatic process, the extracts of the bacteria, including proteins and glucose, enable the growth of the liver cells in a bioreactor. You see here on the right side. And then the liver cells grow first in a liquid media. And when the cell density is high enough, the cells are transferred to another bioreactor to colonize a 3D structure. Here you can see the liver sculpture preserved in formalin after the growing process. So it's a hepatoscopy of alienation, a mutated unicorn with many tentacles instead of one horn. In addition to the liver cell sculpture, I fermented the liver cells and distilled them into alcohol. This works very well because liver cells contain a lot of glucoproteins, uh, sorry, glucogen. On the right side, you see a bottle with the alcoholic distillate from the human liver cells. On the one hand, we get a drink like a bun, the liver drinks itself. On the other hand, it's a kind of cannibalism. This type of cannibalism is based on biotechnology and it is quite different from a cannibalism where human bodies are slaughtered and cooked. Nevertheless, it touches a taboo. But isn't it ethically more correct to feed on own body cells than on other species like plants and animals? In the laboratory and in the exhibition, the human liver cells are fed by bacteria. But in my science fiction story and audio play, the cells are genetically mutated and feed directly on stones. This brings us into an ethical dilemma. We can eat our other species like mammals, insects or plants, or we can food produced in vitro by our own cells. Our body cells offer a new cellular economy without exploiting other species, animals and plants. This offers a new autotrophy of human society. The green revolution is the liberation of all plants and animals from slavery. The anti-green is the real green. In my science fiction story, the old petrochemistry is substituted by a new petrobiology. All commodities are produced by genetically modified human body cells. 
All goods in former times produced by fossil oil like petrol, plastics, fertilizers, fabrics and so on are now produced by over 300 different types of modified human body cells cultivated in bioreactors and fed by inorganic materials like stones and minerals. Thanks to the new camelitoautotrophic metabolism, we need no other species, no glucose or light to grow. We just need stones. This is the new stone age. Prometheus delivered leads into the process of a new materialism where the human body and its tissues are subjected to radical sustainability. The cannibalism of the future will not derive from amorality or dark evil, but from the principle of autotroph resource utilization. Autophagy is no longer metonymic with the savage, the uncivilized and the pre-modern. Instead, it is the ethical imperative for a post-green world and reflects the desire for attaining a paradisiac state of self-containment. Prometheus delivered, there's a story that oscillates between science fiction and horror, utopia and dystopia, and delivers a voices of cannibalism. And in this sense, I propose cannibalism as the new green. So I will come slowly to the end, and at the end I would like to tell you a personal anecdote related to green. In 1996, I traveled to India, where I got married through a Hindu ceremony to a rubber tree. Ficus elastica grows in Indian forests and is a common house plant in Europe. A wedding between a human being and a plant or animal isn't very common in India, but not exceptional either. Every year there are weddings where people are married to other species. Back in Europe, a scientist in Switzerland succeeded in transferring the extracted DNA from my cells to the cell of the ficus by using the chewing gun method. In the context of animism, this is rather usual, but within the context of the laboratory, animism acquires a new signification. So the plant and I, so we don't have really a baby, but we have something like a plantimal. A flower pot, a petri dish, or a bioreactor are small types of a hortus conclusus. And the new unicorns growing there are not just a material imaginations, they are real matter. In the past, fictions were simulacrums, but now fictions come back to their literary meaning. Fictions derives from Latin fingere, which means to forge or to shape matter like clay or wax. Imago ficta was the word for figure or sculpture, and ars figendi was a statuary or sculpture. So fictions are materialized ideas. That's the real meaning. They are still fabulous objects, but the unicorns today become more and more real. Contemporary sculptures and fictions are created in laboratories. But in contrary to the past, they are not just symbols. They are metaphors. In art history, green was a color, but now it becomes a metaphor. Thank you. for questions. So I guess we have microphones around. So we have 15 minutes before metabolizing ourselves. So yeah, we need a great advantage of that because Thomas is heading back to Austria. But exactly this huge sculpture that we have been seeing in the end and this kind of church-like thing is going to open as a kind of very large monographic exhibition this evening opening. And Thomas is just with us today and not this evening. So take care to lose your 15 minutes. You, are you still married? Yes, yes, yes I am. <laughs> and uh, I'm really happy. I, I haven't seen uh, my, my wife, my, my plant, uh, since many years, since 1996. But I, I transferred the flower pot into the forest of Tamil Nadu, which I hope she is uh, 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 growing well. I just wanted to add one thing to the grass. Um, um, analogy, um, the, the power 
um, that's being exhibited by keeping the grass cut because I, I like to tell my students about the concepts of neoclassicism and Baroque art by showing them the similarity between them and mowing their lawn in, in America, in the yes. Spanish uh, mowing of lawns on every Sunday. Um, and how tragic it is that they have to do it themselves versus the aristocracy, of course, had all these people doing it. Um, but apparently, I don't know whether you knew this, in the 1970s it was okay to keep the grass longer. So there's a bit sort of like an interesting connection between... Um, so the like the hair, so it was hippie time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah, for me, the green lawns are um, a part of uh, social representations and also monochrome paintings or paintings in general um, part of this game of representation. So rich people have uh, uh, huge green lawns and huge uh, abstract paintings. <laughs> so, um, thank you. Another question. Um, thank you very much for your uh, presentation and very inspiring talk. I, I was particularly interested in what you said about metaphors and symbols. So my question is uh, following. Um, do you find the notion of material metaphor developed by, for example, Donna Haraway and some other uh, feminist, feminist new materialist thinkers useful? Because Donna Haraway was I think, and also in Catherine Hales, on the other hand, uh, they were pondering on the possibility of developing this um, discursive, hy uh, this discursive material hybrid, actually. So this is what material metaphor basically means. Do you find it useful in your thinking and, and in your practice? Yeah, sure, it, 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 it's useful, so uh, that's why I talked a little bit about the clash of symbols, uh, allegories and uh, uh, metaphors. Uh, so the, the clash of signifier and significat is not just important for my artworks, I think it's a topic general uh, in, in the fine arts. Uh, but uh, to, if we talk about uh, metabolism, we, can, we go one step further. So uh, the um, uh, debate about uh, the clash uh, or the, the coming, the meeting of significant and, uh, significant and signifier was also part of the debate in the 1960s and 70s uh, of conceptual artists uh, in the US and in Europe. Uh, but now uh, we, it's, it's changing. Yeah? We are remembering this debate, but we are going one step further. I also have to thank you a lot for a very, very interesting and inspiring presentation. Uh, and I have been, uh, while I was watching it, I have been thinking about the Ernst Kassir uh, and this thing about the human as a construct of uh, different symbolic practices, art being one of them. Uh, and I'm thinking a bit about the knowledge that is in uh, practicing as an artist choosing the material, choosing the aesthetic, uh, carrying a knowledge that is uh, from a practice that is as complicated as the natural sciences. I wonder if you could perhaps elaborate a little on what is in being an artist, uh, because uh, in conferences like this, uh, sometimes it is like art, the working as an artist is a freedom. Uh, to be a poet is to be free, to be a painter is to be free, but it is also to take on one way of being a uh, human in meeting the world and producing new knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a crucial question. So if I work uh, with um, technology or biotechnology, I always um, have cooperations with, with scientists. And these corporations are very slow. And uh, it means uh, you have to invest a lot of time, a lot of talks, and uh, works like this um, continue for three, four, five years uh, till you are able to, uh, to, to exhibit. And you're right, uh, where's the freedom? 
uh, for your uh, artistic work. Uh, I think for me the freedom is uh, also to use a piece of paper and to use a pencil uh, to make a sketch. Yeah? But you cannot say that the, 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 the complicated work with scientists is, is uh, not so important than the freedom you have with a media like a piece of paper. So I think the point is to bring all these different things in one project. So my freedom is to use an audio play, to use a drawing, which I can do absolutely by my, myself and low tech. And I can also use a, a much more complicated biotechnology uh, together with scientists. So this, this is fun, and this is also a, a part of, of the discussion of what is freedom or what is not freedom. I just would like to ask you about the comment, uh, your comment, can you hear me? Yes, your comment to, to, to your first question, you referred to the tree as she. Yeah. And um, how do you know the tree was she? Yeah, yeah you're right. But, but we're in a, in a mythical sphere of animism, yeah, so I'm not sure if I'm a man, yeah, so she's not sure if she's a woman. So it doesn't matter, it's just a, a, a meeting between different species, and that's the point. It's not the point, it's not a gender point, it's the point is different species. Yeah. I would also like to thank you for this lecture, it was wonderful to hear. And I also found some kind of religious theme in, in the many of the presentations, because you have some kind of uh, inverted consecration. You formed materia into blood, or vice versa. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, what, what do you mean with... Uh, like the masterful uh, yeah. thing, turning water into wine, or... Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, for for me, this is uh, transubstantiation is very interesting for me. Um, I know no other religion or uh, mythical stories uh, in our in, in our culture in other cultures uh, which are dealing with uh, a thing like transubstantiation. Yeah, it's very uh, curious thing. Yeah? Uh, other other uh, people in other countries, the, the, the so-called savage, uh, they were uh, really surprised. What are they talking to these Catholics uh, with, and what they are meaning with transubstantiation? It's a really weird thing. Until today, it's a weird thing. Yeah, and it's not a symbolical act. Yeah? If the priest uh, in the liturgy, uh, in the consecration, does this transubstantiation from wine into blood. No. In the, uh, the, the ideology, the dogma of the Catholics is this is real. And that's really crazy. Yeah? And it happens normally in, in, our, in our cells, in our body. Yeah? So this is life, this is metabolism, but not in a symbolic act like in a, in a liturgy or consecration. So I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm really uh, addicted to this idea of uh, 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 transubstantiation and this uh, alchemistic thing, a spagyric thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, oh, thank you for, uh, for your very inspiring talk. Uh, I want to get to. I want to ask a question, which which might be connected with the core of your of your speech. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the chlorella uh, right, element. You said at some certain point that this is chlorella, which is the, might be treated as a solution to all the problems of the world, right? And I would like to basically maybe join that with the notion of antiform, right, and metabol, right, um, as, the, as the forms of resistance, right, uh, um, resistance as a creative act, right? To all the problems uh, that, that you somehow uh, uh, mentioned uh, here. Yeah, for me, you're right. For me, chlorella is a model organism, organism not just for the uh, natural sciences. For me, it's from for my art, for art in general, and for my art. So I'm playing with this chlorella. 
with the history of chlorella. Yeah, so it's the greenest green because it's the plant cell with the highest concentration of chlorophyll. It's very old. The size of uh, it's a single cell. It's a microalgae. The single cell algae and one cell of uh, chlorella has the same size uh, like our, our blood cells. Yeah, that's very interesting. So we have uh, uh, asso uh, association between uh, red blood and green blood. And we have all these hopes uh, with chlorella yeah, in history, so uh, coming on from the end of the 19th century till today. And especially the last 15 years, yeah, a lot of new projects with chlorella uh, were coming up. So also this project which is, which is going on this year with the uh, University of Stuttgart, they're bringing it to the International Space Station and they want to clean uh, the air and they want to produce food. So we, we still have these utopian ideas with chlorella. And so it's a model organism for art because you can discuss metabolism, you can, can uh, discuss botany, uh, but you can also discuss uh, science fiction, ideologies, um, what's going on in our, in our culture and society. Yes. yes. Uh, oh, I did. Thanks very much. Uh, my question has to do with the unicorn image, and as uh, which I thought was really wonderful, uh, as you explained it, as, um, as a, a critique of modern culture. Uh, and then we looked at your, your sculptures. I, I was just curious, your sculptures then were also unicorns. Um, uh, are there, uh, but I'm thinking now in the moment of the holobont and our understanding of ourselves as biological communities, whether uh, whether you are putting, are you making, I'm just interested, how does it stand with communities of organisms if we get beyond the unicorn? Yeah, that, that, that's a very interesting point. It was not uh, part of, of this talk today, but uh, I'm uh, really interested in organisms like slime molds, for example. Yeah, I really like it. I did projects with slime molds, or uh, also with um, je special jellyfishes. I don't know the English name. Staatsquallen. Yeah, for uh, the, the man of war, for example. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, because it's it looks like one closed individual, like a rabbit or like a human body, but we have uh, different cells and individuals working together and they have one shape, yeah? but it isn't. This is a, it's a swimming city yeah? and they can swim away and come back. They go hunting and come back. It's really crazy. Yeah? You cannot imagine it. Yeah? But this is a really uh, interesting uh, metaphor. Uh, so also in the 19th century, that's why the, the, the English, uh, the, the German word Staatsqualle, yeah? state jelly, yeah? it's very interesting. I think in, in English this word does not exist. And it means it's a social organism, a swimming social organism, yeah? uh, part of uh, thousands of individuals uh, co cooperating together. Yeah, um, I'm intrigued by the refrigerators or the freezers as stands. At first I thought just because it was clever and very minimal and yet hid nothing. Um, and then I realized that there was more to it and I was interested in you speaking about it maybe. Uh, I thought I was curious the idea of the white cube within the white cube. So it was, you know, I also thought it was interested in the notion that it was the thing which stabilized an organism, right? like a freezer keeps something stable, just in the same way that pedestal also stabilizes this, um, this, this object. You know, top of it. And thirdly, I was interested in the idea that the, uh, the freezer is also a certain kind of a stage and a certain kind of micro world in which things exist. And so I was just curious to have you, I'm sure you've thought through these implications and I'd be curious to hear how you yeah, you're right. So, uh, uh, a refrigerator is also a very cold, hot conclusus, and it's a very, very uh, uh, important equipment in every laboratory. So, freezers, deep freezers, and normal freezers, uh, every uh, laboratory. 
So for the, for the process, it was for a technical reason important to use a, a cooling unit. Yeah? Normally you need um, to label or something, this equipment to cool down. Yeah? And uh, this, this equipment works much better yeah, than these uh, refrigerators, they are too weak. Yeah? Uh, but it works. It works maybe for 50 minutes, 60 minutes, then it's over. But the process uh, that uh, is for, for the process time, it's okay. Yeah, it works sharply. Yeah, it's not really. You would never do it in a in a real laboratory, uh, but for an opening, for an exhibition opening, it works. Yeah, and for me, it, it's it's nice to have uh, 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 references to the laboratory, to the to the fridges, uh, to this. Uh, idea of also of how those conclusions and also to the pedestals you, you find in museums and galleries. So it's a, um, a meeting point of, of different references uh, which come together. And uh, so I, I hate uh, these usual uh, pedestals in museums. Uh, so for me, a, ref a refrigerator is much cheaper because I, I use old ones. Yeah? In our Western world, uh, we found uh, thousands, 10,000 of uh, uh, fridges uh, which are wasted, but they are still working. They're completely uh, not out of function. They're right well. Yeah? I I would love to um, link my question to Paul's question. So coming from the, uh, the white uh, cube to the black box, um, asking for elaborating stages for non-human actors, and I would also consider your work as also building stages for non-human actors, as I would say. In your talk, you mentioned that uh, you believe that only fine arts are able to interact or to engage with metabolism. And I would like to ask you uh, if you think that theater will always be incapable of creating interactions on a metabolic level between audience and non-human actors and human actors. Yeah, you're right. That this is, uh, was a provocation, yeah, sure. Uh, I think you can also do it with, with film and movie, you can also do it with literature. Uh, but uh, for me it's very interesting as an artist working with material, with real processes, with organisms, that uh, my exhibition and uh, the works in the exhibition can act like performers, because they are producing, they're doing something, and that's the reason why I call them not objects, I call them subjects. Uh, because they uh, have um, duties, they have wishes, uh, they, have, uh, uh, they want something to do and they are starting a, a process of transformation and transmutation. And that's interesting for me and that's why a sculpture is not a sculpture, a sculpture is also a performer, a non-human non performer. And you are right, you can also do it um, on a, in a theatre, for sure. We have some metabolic theatre on this evening as well. I thank you and uh, our Thomas for coming here despite this very important evening opening that he has in Austria this evening. And uh, yeah, give him a lot of applause before we are ourselves having food. Thank you. See you back at 30, at 1.30. Thank you. Thank you.